On this Debaco University video, we're going to go over the hop latent viroid background. Pretty extensive look, so you have a full understanding of this viroid that's becoming more and more prevalent and getting talked about. So glad to hear you checking on this video. Here I'm going to provide you some background. All right, let's try to learn more about this hop latent viroid and some, kind of where it came from and how it became established. So first off, great research article here. So hop latent viroid, a hidden threat to the cannabis industry. Uh, so if you want to learn more information, welcome to check this, as well as information in the description as well for the references. So uh, this was first found in hops, and that's actually where the name came from, hop latent viroid in 1987. Viruses and viroids often get their name connected with the plant species which was first identified in, and this was first identified in hops, which is a close relative of cannabis. However, this does not mean it only infects this plant. Well, it signifies that plant tissue was found in and could spread to others, as we've now kind of seen. Uh, 1987 was first report of a presence of a vi viroid-like RNA in nucleic acid preparations from two of three commercial hop varieties grown in Spain. If you want to look at the original article, it was published in 1988, uh, I'll provide you a link there and a picture of the first page. This is what hops look like if you haven't seen those. Now, this was originally called uh, duds or dudding disease, um, initially detected in 2019, California. So. 1987 to 2019, a long time there. Early on, it was called duds or dudding diseases of cannabis, which later turned out to be hop latent viroid. Currently, hop latent viroid has become the most devastating cannabis disease uh, in cannabis growing areas, and it's, sadly, it's very widespread. And it's actually wider spread than I think most realize. So a survey conducted in 2021 by the Dark Heart Nursery Research that involved 200,000 tissues to test included that, or concluded that 90% of cannabis growing facilities in California were contaminated with hop latent viroid. However, realize this is not just uh, contained to California. This is only where the geographic uh, sample for this survey was conducted. Hoplite and has been detected throughout the cannabis growing facilities of entire of North America and probably beyond. So I don't think it's just California. That's just where they did the original study. So why is this a concern? Why should it be, if you haven't heard about it, why should we, we be concerned? Well, infected crops could suffer anywhere from a 50 to 70% loss in the THC content, thus considerably lowering their commercial value. And it's going to also affect CBD as well, uh, and other cannabinoids, I'm sure. A survey conducted in 2001, again, revealed that approximately 90% of chemist growing facilities in that California tested positive, and 30% of the plants in each facility showed symptoms of this viroids infection. So I think it's a very widespread issue uh, that might be initially going unnoticed. So why is it called a latent viroid? Where did it kind of get that name from? Well, uh, originally it was tentatively hop uh, viroid like RNA fast was its original name since it is similar to avocado sunblotch uh, viroid but had different physical as well as biological properties with faster electrophoric mobility than the hop stunt viroid. 17,000 hectares of hop gardens in, Ger in uh, Germany was surveyed for this kind of hop of viroid like RNA fast, and it was found in all of the hop cultivars. Worldwide testing showed the presence of hop latent viroid in most of the hop cultivars. And again, that's a little bit of a scary thing when we're seeing this uh, so widespread. However, since this hop viroid like RNA fast did not induce any visible disease symptoms, at least in hops, it was tentatively named hop latent viroid. That's kind of where we get the name that we still use today. The hidden disease. So again, we're looking at hops here. Although hop latent viroid uh, infected hop uh, plants are symptomless, inf infection significantly does reduce their marketable value. Via yield and other alpha uh, bitter acids and essential oil content in the hop cone. So again, does create a reduced uh, efficiency of the, of the plant. Subsequently, hop latent virus detected 90 to 100% of the tested hop germplasms in European countries. So anything 90 plus percent, a little bit an area of concern. So what does this kind of uh, mean? That's again, some more of the background there. What are we kind of looking at here? When it was first being discovered, at least in hops, there were 
no really found effects, which means it's present, but not really causing a noticeable problem. In this case, latent is referring to being asymptomatic, meaning that it is there, its presence physically there, but not really visually noticeable. So we're talking about asymptomatic, you know, what is that kind of really referring to? Um, it's there, but really no issues. And I always say that, well, not exactly, because even though this is the name given, even in hops, it can cause an issue with oil and acid levels affecting that final crop. Even though it may not cause a vi visual in your face kind of look to the leaves, it's causing that reduction in yield. Also, depending on the cultivar of the hops, the degree to which it has an impact can also vary. In chemists, this viroid is not asymptomatic, so it does show visual symptoms. Now, it can also have secondary impacts. So when we're looking at a plant that's infected, it can become more susceptible to other diseases, particularly fusarium wilt and powdery mildew. Another uh, great researcher provided a link in the description here, providing uh, some of these uh, images, just to kind of give you that kind of uh, example of how when you get this uh, viroid, you can get other issues. So while both of these leaves do have powdery mildew, you can see one clearly has it more severe than the other. This is positive for hoplite and viroid, this is negative. Same thing observed with fusarium, which is a root-based disease that will then infect the xylem of the stem tissue. Now it does seem to be stable. So this is kind of an interesting part of this viroid. So overall genetic screening seems to be showing minimum variability across geographic regions. Even back to the 1980s, hot viroid has not really undergone a lot of mutations compared to what was found today. Now this is really interesting because considering we see viroids to higher eukaryotes, considering the small number of nucleotides, it's a good thing as changes or mutations can occur very quickly. When you have a smaller genome size, your rate of mutation typically is higher, but this hoplite viroid is showing some stability. Other viroids do show changes, mutations, and sequences uh, when there's a host change, so that needs to be taken into consideration. But overall, at least right now, early indications of this viroid, pretty stable, pretty um, a consistent sequence, at least for most part. Now, secondary structure for viroids is important because viroids do lack a protein coat, like a virus would have, so secondary structure is key to determine its ability to infect a particular host plant. Investigating the secondary structure is important for understanding the host viroid relationship. So you can kind of think about this as the secondary structure, just the shape it's taking on, kind of like the key in the lock concept. The key changes and the lock stays the same, well, it's not going to be really a good fit, and vice versa. So this is kind of that host viroid relationship. If there's a lot of changes, uh, will potentially be, make it more virulent or particularly potentially less virulent. Now we have also sequence uh, variation. So hoplite and viroid species isolate from hops, and this is all kind of provided here in Jingbank with the account number and the numbers if you want to go back and take a look at it yourself. And all of the hoplite and viroid sequences are isolated from cannabis plants were compared. So kind of what the information we have, taking that, comparing it. All of the hoplite and viroid sequences isolated from Kim's plants that are available in the NCBI were retrieved. This is kind of, you can kind of look at it yourself. Only the full length sequences, 250 uh, nucleotides, was considered for this analysis that's going to be presented. Uh, there's CAN1 and CAN2, two distinctive hoplite and viroid isolates. You've got the exact numbers and codings right here. Now, they're not bacteria. I just put bacterial images here. When we talk about isolates, this is kind of what we think of, but we're talking about something that can only be seen with the uh, electron microscope. Now, for CAN1, 100% sequence similarity to the hoplite and viroid uh, type species. It's a good thing. Uh, CAN2 had one mismatch, meaning it had a point mutation at the nucleotide number 225. So 225, count those nucleotides, there was a mutation there. With the uracil mutated to the adenine. As compared to the hoplite and viroid type species, and this was referred to as U225A. CAN2 isolate was 100% identical to hoplite and viroid isolate retrieved from a commercial um, hop garden in China. And you can kind of have that example of that um, matching there on the sequence basis. So where have these isolates actually been found? Well, they've actually been found uh, in Delta County, Colorado. It was found to be 100% similar to CAN1 isolate. CAN2 matched with a uh, hoplite and viroid isolate in both Santa Barbara, California, as well as Boulder counties in Colorado. So just to give you that little kind of uh, idea here, we're looking at this area. 
here and then in two counties here in Colorado. This indicates the presence of at least two hoplite virus sequence variants infecting cannabis, but we're not going much beyond that. So just lastly, I just want to talk about that um, U225A, the single nucleotide change, uh, did not affect the structure of the CAN2 isolate as compared to uh, that of the type species. Note this change is located within the lower pathogenicity domain. So it's kind of a good thing. Again, it's not going to really change the virulence there. This is a little bit more detail than you may want, but that is the secondary structure. Uh, boxed region here is the terminal conservative uh, hairpin and central conserved regions there. Uh, arrow indicates the U225A point mutation. See again that uracil go into adenine observed in the hop latent virus isolate from a commercial hop garden in China. So we could see again, not a lot of you know, sequences. This is uh, very small compared to other genomes of bacteria, eukaryotes, and even viruses. But there's that little mutation, not really increasing the pathogenicity, showing a very stable viroid, giving us something we can hopefully be able to target and attack without dealing with a whole lot of variants.